Uh, we are so grateful for you to be here Absolutely. on NATV. Thank you all for being here live, listening live. If you're here, hit us up in the comments. Let us know you're here. Say hello. I am Amber Legato here bringing you intentional content, giving you educational, you know, little drops that are quick and easy to understand. Um, Crystal, tell us a little bit about your podcast as well. Crystal. Yes, my name is Crystal Black. You can follow me over on YouTube. It's Crystal, Crystal Dash Tease over on YouTube. And you can always reach out to me at Crystal Black Pure Podcasting at gmail.com. So glad to meet you, Lisa. Thank you. And then Susie. And, yeah, and I'm Susie with a Z, uh, Susie with a Z podcast show. Um, you can find me on YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, and Susie with a Z podcast show at Gmail for, um, yeah email. So yeah, we're so excited to do this again. Uh, this is our second Look live us. together. I think the three of us, and we're so yes. happy to have Elisa here as well. Um, Elisa, really quick, let us know what does the MSS stand for in <laughs> yes. your title here? Yes. I mean, right. Like big, important letters. Yeah. Um, no, it's, it stands for a master's of social service degree. So master, it, you're a master. That's a big deal. Well, yeah, I mean, I guess so. And it's specific to um, my alma mater, which is Bryn Mawr School of Social Work. So I love that. I think that's amazing. Yeah. Um, tell us also the LCSW. What does that stand for? Yeah. So that stands for Licensed Clinical Social Worker. I love this. This is awesome. So you deal a lot with families and children. Um, and, and tell us like what kind of circumstances you specialize in as a master. Yeah, so I have a private practice and I specialize in working with adult children of narcissists, as well as folks struggling with disordered eating and give <laughs> body image. Um, and then I'm adding a new specialty area, which is uh, religious trauma and cult abuse as well. So I'm doing some training in that. Amazing. Interesting. Good stuff. We were all gonna... talking about that, listening to your podcast yes. about that. That was the first episode that we were listening to. That was awesome. Um, Thank you. Thank you. We're, yeah. we're going to dive into that in just a second, but I want to bring up really quick. We were talking about our favorite foods just before the show started, and I found yes. it so interesting um, that you said you were from Wisconsin. Originally, and yes. I want you to tell us again, what is your favorite food, Elisa? <laughs> well, I did say two, to be fair. So you I did. Said, you I did. Said nachos, and then I said butter. I love this. Now, explain <laughs> explain the butter. We need to hear I mean, about the butter. What's to explain? It's butter. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I remember when I was a kid, I used to dive into the butter tub, like the country crock. My yeah. mom would think that somebody accidentally opened, or she grabbed like one that was already opened until one time she finally had yeah. realized that I was in a car seat, like reaching into the butter tub, like licking my fingers. Oh, <laughs> butter makes everything better. It does. It sure does. That's that's that is an extreme sound effect. That was loud. Yeah, that, that was, was a good one. Yeah, right? That's how you feel inside. I love it so much. <laughs> Can never have too much. But I love exactly. fish and nachos and butter. That's like what I lived off of the last two days. So I appreciate that. Yeah. I love nachos too. I, I once saw a perfectly like fluffed up like tray of nachos that were so perfectly like everything was so even and had the perfect amounts of like avocado and and salsa and meat and beans and cheese i was i was in tears it was such a beautiful yeah, you're making breakfast. me hungry now i know right <laughs> i haven't had breakfast yet do either. you guys make them i make them at the house regularly i don't know I like different kinds of nachos like barbecue <laughs> style regular thing. okay hey, kind of like a messy taco right i've never made nachos really yeah that tacos so yes nachos no yeah, the secret is Not you have to put cheese on every layer of the chips. Okay. Yes. All the way down to the bottom. Well, you know how tacos mm -hmm. fall apart? You can make the fall apart mm -hmm. of the tacos into nachos. Yes. yes. It's like second dinner. Good idea. You can get creative with <laughs> that. You can do refried beans on the bottom. I had black beans, so I was mashing them up the other day and putting that on the bottom instead of meat and then melting the cheese and the pico and just layers. Yes. Cilantro. I'm big on cilantro. I don't know about you guys. Sour cream. Mm, no, 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 no. I am one of the people that 
Yeah, cilantro. You either love it, yeah. You don't Does it like taste it. like soap to you? Yeah, okay. You love or hate it? Yeah. No. That's love why I brought it up. It. Isn't that weird? weird? Yeah, it is. <laughs> I think it's something it's like, actually, like a cog, you know, it's like a genetic slash, yeah. you know, cognitive thing. And um, so, yeah, it, uh, like no, no go with the cilantro. <laughs> Good to know. No cilantro on Good your nachos. To know if I'm making <laughs> you nachos registered. All right. Before we jump into the podcast, oh, the three of us all had seen a post of yours, and I know we have the tile up here, and we'll bring it up whenever it's ready, but talking about triangulation manipulation, you oh. really hit the head, like the nail on the head for all three of us. I feel like we've all experienced triangulation manipulation. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how Actually, Susie, I think you brought this up, I, and I'm sure you have some questions around this as well. I'd, mm -hmm. I'd rather you take over on that one. My question, when I when I saw it, my question is, like, I just got out of an abusive long-term relationship. So I'm a couple of years out. I'm doing well, healing, doing all, all the things. Um, but I still have people in my life that are working that same system. So I'm, I still find myself in those circumstances with certain people. What sure. do I do? It's almost like I taught everyone how to treat me. And even though my abuser's gone, mm -hmm. there's still like, it's still happening. Sure. It's like by proxy. Yes. <laughs> I don't know how to explain it. Yes. I mean, I think, right, when we've been in these kind of narcissistic, let's say, and I use that always as a spectrum type of mm -hmm. relationships, or we've come from narcissistic family systems, we're predisposed to kind of following those patterns. Yes. And the first step I always, you know, share with folks is awareness. And just starting with kind of gathering our own boundaries around awareness, like what is acceptable to us, and right. what is no longer acceptable to us, yeah. and standing in our own truth around that. Yeah, it's it, it's taken me a while because I've realized that I've taught everyone how to treat me because I tolerated so much. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and it's now okay. Nobody knows what to do with me because I switched up the rules. Right, I changed the game. <laughs> I'm not tolerating it any longer. I'll right. walk out. That's right, and that right, the system then can't operate in the same way that it once did, mm -hmm. and that can be a shock to everybody else in the system too. Oh, yeah. It's it's almost like playing a board game and you flip the board game and then you try to put the pieces back on the board and play, continue playing. Nobody knows their role any longer. Right. And I'm just learning my role. Right. So, so what yeah. would you suggest? Like, what, what, how do I, how do I like go down this Good new question. path and kind of bring everyone with me? Well, They're not ready for therapy. I mean, I would <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. I just in. want to pause really quick before you answer that. Can you tell our audience what triangulation manipulation is? Yeah. So if you think of um, the narcissist being at sort of the center of the solar system, if you will, the nucleus, and they form an alliance with somebody else in that system. And then you may have somebody out on the edge that kind of turns into the scapegoat. It could be a sibling, the other spouse, whatever. And so the triangulation is the kind of, um, you know, valley, what's the word I'm looking for? Juxtaposition or changing the positions in this triangulation pattern. Mm -hmm. And all of the information passes through the narcissist. Yeah. So, you know, they're the, the spokesperson, if you will. They're passing on information that may or may not be the reality of what's actually happening. It's their reality, not necessarily there the reality. Mm -hmm. So, um, oh, there's my it's slide weird. right there. So, so you would people say that the, the right. What'd you say, Crystal? Like where you're pitting people against each other. Like it's like you're setting them up. Right. Yes. I was going to say, so would you say right? the narcissist is trying to control and manipulate the mindset of the people that they're manipulating in that triangulation? They're trying to control the, um, what do you call it? The narrative? Yes, that's a great way of putting it. And the narrative being, um, you know, the commanding factor is the narcissist fear of abandonment, real or perceived. Yeah. 
So would that's you, what's driving. Would you say that a codependent parent that is the enabler of the narcissist could also be triangulating Absolutely. manipulation to gain that need for codependent relationships with their children? Yeah, because, right, for the system to function, the other spouse has to be a participant in some way or another. Right. So they're either enabling, they may also have some narcissistic, you know, and I kind of put the whole cluster B spectrum in there, you know, borderline histrionic, antisocial is over on its own thing. That's a whole different thing. Um, yeah, so they they have to be a participant in it somehow. And they may have learned that in order to keep the peace, it's better just to go along with the narcissist. Mm -hmm. that's, that's how I lived for many, many years. Yeah. Um, they, I felt like I was being outcasted. I was being isolated from other family members. Yes. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's being on the outside looking in now. It's, it's sad to me, really? you know, because yeah. it went to the extreme where I totally yes. disassociated from everybody and yep. self-isolated and was not in a good place. I mean, it took a lot for me to finally get out. So. Yeah, I mean, and that's that's the goal, right? Is to mm. keep that person for themselves because yeah. anytime we set those boundaries or try to, let's say, leave the system, that fear of abandonment for the narcissist gets activated. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I really like that you used dissociating, Susie, because that's a really um, intelligent and intentional way of, of mentioning like where you go when you're being triangulated. Um, I love, and I know we're about to get into this, so hold tight on the podcast. I love what it's called and we'll get into that in a second, but mm -hmm. triangulation manipulation is what makes you feel crazy. Mm -hmm. I personally yeah. am the scapegoat in my family and, um, like having that feeling like you don't belong, that feeling like, everyone is against you that feeling like nobody believes you is such a stressful thing to carry in your life and i'm going to be 35 this next year mm -hmm. like that's a long time like i i i'm estranged from my family 2 years now and and for me the last 2 years have been eye opening to realize like you truly are manipulated in such a way that makes you feel outcasted it's yeah. wild yeah but you know, uh, I think it's always interesting that, like, when we come, especially to that, when you're a parent, I was gonna say, yeah, you know, mm -hmm. and we have that kind of come to Jesus moment where we realize, oh my gosh, this is what I've been dealing with, right? It can, it, it's really earth shattering. It, our whole world can be turned upside down. Absolutely. Can, have you had a come to Jesus moment where it was just like a pop in your own life and your own experience. Yes. Can you yeah. tell us a little bit about that, what that feels like? Sure. I mean, I had a therapist early on um, that kind of opened my eyes to the fact that I was maybe being raised in a narcissistic family system. And I remember thinking, oh my God, it's not my, you mean it's not my fault? You mean this is not my fault? And that was wonderful. Mm. And I'll also say terrible at the same time, mm. because then you thus begins the healing process. You can't ever go back because now, you know, and so true. That's, that's really sad. Um, there's a lot of grief and loss involved yeah. but on the other side. And this is what I tell people like you are waiting for you on the other side of this and that's worth it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The and, other and side is, know. yeah, the other side is so amazing. That was definitely one of my questions. Ask it. Ask it again. Crystal. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, I know. We're, we're all like bubbling. We have so much to ask. But it was, I was wondering, yeah, like what inspired you to become the therapist and the social, and what got you on the, you know, the specializations of helping adult children of narcissists. Yeah. And obviously that was one of the questions leading up to it, but what really motivated you to make, okay, this is going to be my career. I'm going to dedicate my life to, to doing this. What really pushed yeah. you over the edge to go in that direction? Well, it's like career number five for me. So I'll say that I'm a career changer. I was a vocal music <laughs> teacher and choir director for many years and then um, switched to being a performer, a professional like actress and musical theater performer in the Philadelphia area. 
And then I remember just thinking, wow, oh. this is this isn't worth it so much for me anymore. I was missing a lot of things of my daughters and um, you know, just not worth it anymore. So then I had always been fascinated by psychology. My father was a clinical psychologist, and I was really fascinated when he would share things. And so it just came time to kind of look into going to grad school and Social work was a very, you know, it gives you a lot of variety in what you can do with the degree. And that's how I, you know, came to go to grad school. And then um, my first job in the field, once I graduated, was working at an inpatient drug and alcohol facility as a therapist. So I did mm -hmm. that for a number of years and then worked at a group practice. And then March of 2020 opened my own private practice. And I originally was working with folks with eating disorders. And what I found was, in addition to my own part of the story, I found that a lot of the folks that I was working with who had eating disorders were coming from these seemingly narcissistic family systems. Mm. So that's kind of what led me to mm -hmm. that specialty area. That's why one of the factors. Mm -hmm. I've experienced that. I think we all have wow. to some degree. Yeah. yeah. It's hard to eat when you're stressed out all the time or on edge or waiting for the next bomb to, to drop, literally. Yes, absolutely. And, um, you know, one of the manifestations of coming from a narcissistic family system really is, you know, coming to having an eating disorder. I mean, that's yeah. definitely an offshoot of coming out of these systems. So. I definitely, I, for me, like, I don't think I've ever experienced an eating disorder, like consciously, personally, but I can definitely say that on the other end of it, like I did not learn how to take care of myself because I learned how to take care of everyone else and put everyone else's needs first that like, there are other mm -hmm. things on a hyg hygienic level that I struggle with personally that are, I mean, could be compared to an eating disorder in the sense of like the amount of struggle that I have with them. But like, I find it interesting how difficult life is for anyone that's left a narcissistic family system. Yeah, for sure. absolutely. I think that's a really great point. Um, I work with folks too that just like daily hygiene, mm -hmm. you know, brushing the teeth, you know, making the bed. It's really a struggle at times. Yeah. And that's absolutely it, right? Like we we were conditioned to serve everybody else's needs, to anticipate mm -hmm. everybody else's needs and emotions. Mm -hmm. Ours completely went by the wayside. So it makes sense that our sense of self, if there at all, is incredibly lacking. Absolutely. And Crystal and I have had lots of conversations about ADHD and PTSD and how very tied in together they are, that it's almost hard to tell exactly what kind of mental disorders that people have coming out of the system because all of them are so different and there's so many different pieces to the puzzle. And we talk about layers. I love it. Crystal always mentions layers. Like there's so many layers to dysfunction and like the um, repercussions of all of it, for sure. Crystal, do you want to jump into the It makes podcast? sense. It's just like what you were saying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was going to say, just like what you were saying, we're like, oh, I'm not sure that I've ever had an eating disorder per se. And I'm like, I'm thinking the same thing, but my God, I feel like I've had a day in the life of almost every single you know, piece of the rainbow. And it's like, I haven't yeah. technically had one, but it, I guess it's because it's all stemming. And at least you could say yay or nay, but just the whole idea of body issues, right? Body shaming, body distortions. It's like that whole general concept stemming from these narcissistic family systems and just the dysfunction, um, toxicity in general. It's like, well, that's why there's such a spectrum where somebody might have like anorexia or bulimia over here, or someone might have a completely different it just runs a spectrum and i guess that's why it makes sense because i feel like i've had a little piece of the pie of everything but i don't have an ongoing you know like issue or disorder with eating but i've had such body distortions coming out and just going through the healing process with that mm -hmm. i mean have you seen that in some of your patients and just Absolutely. yeah audience members where it keeps Absolutely. changing or it's like why am i gaining weight and i was losing weight <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, it does definitely happen to me over time. I'm like, yeah, and I I want to myth bust here for a moment if I can, right? Like, we think typically of eating disorders as you have to be anorexic or you're bulimic, or, you know, I would say if there is a dysfunctional relationship with food, that is something. I'm, Mm -hmm. you know, we don't need to label it as something necessarily, but we've learned in these systems again you know, image, body, Mm -hmm. control, extension of self from the parent to the child, it's all parts of it. So it makes sense again that our body, there's a wonderful article called, um, yes, your narcissistic mother hates your body and here's why. Um, That, you know, is it's definitely a thing, right? Like we were extensions of them. We had, Mm -hmm. you know, we had to look like they wanted us to look. Mm -hmm. We had to be the perhaps weight they felt was appropriate, eat what was appropriate, don't eat what's not appropriate, right? Lots of rules, lots of rigidity, lots of mixed messaging. And so that that can come into, um, Mm -hmm. you know, that can then extend to food, drugs, self-harm, you name it, right? Like we can, we can have the same dysfunctional relationships, not only with people, but with things in our lives, shopping, whatever. I love like, that explanation. Like that's so powerful. Mm-hmm. Cause like I'm thinking about my childhood right now yeah. and my parents didn't really lay out rules necessarily, but definitely like always told me what not to do. Yeah. So I didn't know what to do because I always thought that what I was going to do was the wrong thing to do, but I was never given the like tools or the, the layout of what I should do. Yeah. And that makes so much sense. That's there's, wild. Yeah, there's no autonomy given. No. Right? So you're not allowed to choose what you eat. You're not allowed to choose what you wear. Oh, yeah. And then the food is just given, right? Like, right. and all of it was like processed, like really bad junk food. Like, that's what I grew up on. So now I'm starting to see, wow, okay, maybe I do have some kind of disorder in eating because I never know what to eat because I don't want to eat any of the crap that I was given as a kid. I want to eat, you know, healthy, good for me, but I have no idea where to start. And I don't even know, like, and then when I do know where to start, I forget about it because I have ADHD. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, so everything goes bad. <laughs> the biggest thing we can do is take worth away from food. Mm. Take morality away from food. Food is just food. Ooh. Be it chips, be it vegetables, be it whatever, mm. right? Like, that's something I try to help folks with too, is there's nothing, there's no good or bad food. If you didn't write that down, folks, write it down. Food is just food. I wrote it down. I needed, yeah. I needed to hear that for yeah. sure. So, I mean, we can have chips. Good we method. Can have, right? Like, but, but most importantly, we can decide Nachos. what we yeah. want to eat. Not what the narcissistic system tells us, not what societal systems tell us. Absolutely. You know, Love that. Right. I, I see Tiffany down here because showing up. A lot up of it is our thought patterns. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yes. I was going to read thank that. Thank you, Tiffany, for being here. <laughs> no, it's okay. I think there's a little bit of a lag with us, Crystal. I keep like talking yeah. and then we like keep merging together and I love it. It's the best. Oh, I know. <laughs> um, it's because they're too quick. They're trying to make okay. a lag so we slow down. Yes. <laughs> I realize Tiffany's here um, validating just the beginning of our I'm conversation. We about didn't quite answer process. Susie's question. Um, Susie had asked, how do we avoid triangulation manipulation? So I want to take us back there before we get okay. into the podcast. Um, and I, I want Susie's question oh, to right. be answered because I feel like it will also answer the question okay. for Tiffany here. You know, how do we how do we avoid triangulation manipulation when it still exists in our family system? Right. Yeah, uh, it's hard. I'll say that first, um, we have to have awareness and we really have to begin experimenting with boundaries. And what does that mean? Experimenting with boundaries? Um, I would say starting with things within ourselves, right? Like, okay, I'm going to try not scrolling on my phone more than an hour right now or mm-hmm. whatever, right? We're just, we're going to start to have some relationship with, with boundaries personally. Okay. I have a quick question before we dive any deeper. Is this yeah. mentioned in your um, gaslighting recovery journal? Uh, probably. 
Okay. <laughs> I want I want people to go in and, and dig in deeper to you. You know, we want them to yeah. really come into what you've already have. This is already stuff that you have available on oh, you thanks. know yeah. your stuff. Absolutely. So tell us um where they can find the gaslighting recovery journal. Yeah, I'll hold it up for anybody watching. It's right here. Okay. There, there we Gorgeous. go. Gorgeous. Love it. Red is your color, girl. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. It is. Isn't that nice? <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, that's, that's the book. You can get it on Amazon. Okay. There's a link on my website to it. Um, I think Target had it. Yeah. So check it out. Um, but Problem definitely practices for healing from emotional abuse. I feel like this is something you would mention about, you know, better boundaries, how to set boundaries. Yes. yes. How There's to avoid the triangulation manipulation. Chapter. Yeah. So it's like a workbook, correct? Um, it's a journal. There okay. is a workbook that's actually the first book in the series. And then I wrote the second one, which is a journal. And so I just okay. try to give people prompts and um, various experiments and places to write down stuff and just different ways to consider things, just different ways to feel through things. Mm -hmm. I love it. Crystal, what is the name of Elisa's podcast? Oh my gosh, you're not the crazy one. What? Right there on the Apple <laughs> Thank Podcast. You. I like, I love it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the title, Elisa. Yes. Thank you for that. Yes. We all needed to hear it. We're not yes. the crazy one. Well, thank you. It's it, it, The title's been a journey, so this is where it's arrived now. So, yes. I Do was you, in... Oh, I'm sorry. Nope, I was in therapy. Um, I, I've been in therapy for almost three years now. And I, it took me probably about eight months before I believed my psychiatrist that I wasn't crazy. And yeah. every, every week, sometimes three times a week, I would say, are you sure I'm not crazy? Are you sure I'm not crazy? And I'm, I'm serious. I, I asked him to hospitalize me. I said, there's got to be something wrong with me. Yeah. I, wow. I was a shell of a human being. I was, yeah. yeah. And now I, now I know I wasn't the crazy. I'm not the crazy one. Right. No, absolutely and, and not. I think that's typical that you know, when we walk away from these types of relationships, that's part of the triangulation and the gaslighting, right? Is if we're sitting there going, oh, wait, did I do that? Maybe I did do that. Maybe I was really mean there. Maybe I, you know, that's an indicator that something yeah. might be going on there when we have such self-doubt around our own actions and, you know, what we've said or anything. Yeah. Alisa, is this available on all podcast platforms? I believe so. I know Spotify, iTunes, uh, iHeartRadio. All right, audience, you hear you hear that. Go and check out this podcast. It's a, yes. it's available and on iTunes, on Spotify. Um, check it out. I want to know what's the first step we need to take into beginning to understand that we are not the crazy one. Where do we go first? I would say go to resources first. What so, kind of resources we're talking about? Yeah, something like this, podcasts, books. And then I would definitely not do this alone. And I would do this kind of recovery work with the help of someone that specializes in the nuances and uniqueness of narcissistic abuse. I'm so glad you said that mm -hmm. because I, I was looking okay. you up. I found your link tree. Um, I know we've got that available as well. That link is in your bio on Instagram. Um, and when I saw it, my biggest thing about my own journey was community. Having community yeah. is so important. So I saw you had Shattering the Mirror, Support and Recovery uh, Group for Adult Children of Narcissists. And that is epic. Um, I know you said that it's on hold right now, but tell yeah. us about this group. Tell us about, yeah. you know, what, what this has done for others um, and, and just a part of your own journey with it. Yeah, so um, this was a group that I had run for about three years. And it just felt like the right time to kind of just stop it briefly, uh, or not briefly, it's been stopped for a little bit now. Mm -hmm. But, you know, my vision with it was that people just wouldn't be alone, they would understand they would come to this group, and they would have a community of other folks that had, you know, lived their story a little bit. And that maybe once the group had ended, even because I, I would kind of run it. Um, once we reached capacity, we ran for eight sessions. And then a new cohort would begin. So my, my 
fantasy was that people would kind of then continue, you know, working with one another, helping one another, supporting one another, even after the group had ended. I love it. I think it's amazing because honestly, like when I first started my journey two years ago, I found ACA and I love that you mentioned um, alcoholics and drug addicts in the process of like becoming into like where you're doing your, your masters and everything. Um, I found ACA after reading a book called healing the child within, but learning that I wasn't the crazy one took me going to meetings and listening to other people's stories that sounded just like mine, but different, you know, like, yeah. And, and that was the biggest thing for me was community. And even now at this point, being a host for NATV, having, you know, Crystal and Susie and, and other people who have come through the channel, you know, you find your people, you find your soul tribe. Yeah. yeah. I can so relate to that, Amber. I mean, me with the women's group. I mean, yeah. my story was a bit extreme. So it ended up with a police officer that called the women's center um, and the shelter and the hotline. And just to have those those there to help me um, pretty much saved my life, I would say. I knew I wasn't alone. I knew someone was always on the other line. Um, the groups were phenomenal. The women sharing their stories. Some of them have been in there for 10, 20 plus years, and they mm-hmm. still show up to help You know the new people coming in that are just like so confused. Like, yeah, because what they the know what it feels happened. like to be alone. Yeah. They know what it feels like to be doing it on their own. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so important I, community. I, I, I love this picture. You know, my, my favorite moments in the group where somebody would say something and then everybody else would nod along and be like, mm-hmm. oh my mm-hmm. God, yes. Those were my favorite moments. Yeah. Absolutely. And even can I just say, I love this, this picture of you, Lisa? Yes, it's so <laughs> cute. <laughs> <laughs> it does, you. it but, makes you smile. I had a great photographer, have a great photographer. Um, I'll give her a shout out. Photo Lady Photos. She's out of Philly. It was probably one of my favorite sessions I've had working with somebody. And and the most comfortable I've felt. You look look happy. You look look bright. You look like you're having a great time. And you look proud of yourself. And that's important. And for such a serious topic, I mean, we still need to remember we we can be happy. We don't have to, you know, I, it took me yeah. a long time to get out of the misery and then the self-pity. And then, oh, it was just horrible. Now, like, I enjoy having fun. I enjoy mm-hmm. smiling and laughing. And it took a long time for me to be able to be comfortable enough to be myself again. And I'm still in the process. Yeah. Wouldn't so you say that's so a important. part of the narcissist wanting yeah. to control, you know, how you feel? The narcissist wants you to be miserable because mm-hmm. that brings them joy. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Sad and st- oh, sadistic as that sounds, right? Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. part of their supply is when people are struggling. They, yeah. they kind of, that's, you know, that's the food, the air that they breathe. Yeah. yeah. Struggling, so, whether yeah. I was miserable like or sick. Know. Yeah. You know, constantly physically sick. I'm sorry, Crystal. It's hard to figure out who you are or like, who are we authentically? Cause you guys were saying earlier how they tell you what not to be, what not to eat, what not to do. And it's coming from a negative place, right? Like yeah. instead of, it's, of course, that's why we had to figure out who, what do we like to do? I remember it took me years. I'm like, I was keep kept myself so busy and running around like a chicken with my head cut off. Right. That mm-hmm. I was like, wait, what do I act? actually like you lose yourself i did anyway it it does it takes years and and time you know going in these communities in these groups and i had to take classes i started doing acting classes i know that was my thing years ago when my son was really little he was like two when i started doing that because that was one of the things i wanted to do when i was a kid and i'm like why haven't i done that you know Mm -hmm. and you just start playing around and figuring out what you like that was actually one of my questions it just brought me back to that at least (laughs) out of curiosity yeah. When you were a kid, i like, do you have a certain dream? I always love asking people that. Or d- was there something you wanted to do or you dreamed of um, when you were a child, even before you learned you wanted to do all this? Yeah. I mean, I was always a performer. I was I was a dancer from the age of three on, um, you know, had a lovely community theater in my town that I did tons of productions with. and And that was... Uh, saving I mean that that saved me I think just that escape into Mm -hmm. character and song and music um so 
Cool. That was something that was always really important that I think I had always wanted to do. I really love that. Like your whole life, like I was going to say when you were telling us about your different careers, like you're yeah. really giving a lot of us out here hope. Like for me, I've always been trying to find that one mm -hmm. thing that I'm supposed to do, but I'm recognizing it's okay to explore lots of different options. I've changed my hair. I can't even tell you how many times since 2020. <laughs> like there are videos on NATV of me with like bright blue hair. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I shaved my head two years ago. Uh, I just cut it this last week and dyed it black. Like there's so much dysmorphia and like trying to like figure out who I want to be. And I honestly don't feel like I ever settle on one thing. I feel like I get bored with it and I want to try something new. And yeah. I never had that freedom growing up as a kid. Right. I, I think that's encouraging, you know, to tell people it's okay to try new things. It's okay to do things differently. Oh my gosh. Yes. And, you know, I think I used to struggle with these polarities of I have to be like this very conservative corporate -y kind wow. of person versus this really creative soul with tattoos and piercings and whatever. They can mm -hmm. coexist. We can Absolutely. Stand, right. And it doesn't yes. have to be the all or nothing that happens in these systems. Yeah. We can have the yes hand and we can yeah, one day try something, the Amen. next day try something else, and, you know. Yeah, this is the fun part. Yeah, <laughs> this is the fun part. You know, <laughs> this is like, it's so exciting. Like, I could do anything. We can we can right. really do anything, be anyone we want to be. Yeah, if, you know, I, we're reparenting our inner child and, and discovering, I, discovering the world, discovering I, ourselves again. I love that you brought up uh, reparenting. Um, it's such a good thing to like bring up to just change our perception, you know, and change our conscious value of like what we're doing as adults, because we are all children in some way. Um, I had a conversation with a, a girl last night that um, she, she said, you know, I can't imagine what it's like being a parent because I'm having such a hard time with responsibilities for myself. And I said, honestly, I feel like it's really equivalent because I didn't know that I was being irresponsible until it had a kid. And that child like made me realize <laughs> that I wasn't taking care of myself. She made me realize how I wasn't providing the things that I needed for me. And so it is a reparenting thing for everyone, even if you don't have children, even if you are like in your forties and you don't have kids, like you can still treat your own self like a child and reparent in, in a way that you can try new things. It's never too late to do that thing you dreamed of as a kid. And that's typically the kind of work that I do with folks. Perfectly said. Therapy is um, that inner child healing work. So I, yeah. I, I do what's called, uh, one of the modalities I use is called internal family systems or IFS. Mm -hmm. And it just lends itself beautifully to kind of that reparenting yes. uh, validation that we never got. The, the being seen, being heard and being loved in ways that we needed to be loved. I love that. My therapist specializes in IFS and um, she brings it up all the time. We do a lot of... Um, just uh, distress tolerance therapy and uh, working through anger and uh, emotions because as a 34 year old, I don't know how to regulate my emotions and I'm learning how to do that. And when I have my six year old who's explosive right. and has these huge feelings, those feelings become my feelings because I don't know what to do with them. And it's so wild. Like it can feel so, um, not not demeaning or degrading, but just you can feel kind of dumb in some of these moments because you didn't have those tools at a young age. And these are the tools my daughter needs to learn yeah. at her young age. So right. we're learning it together. Yeah. Right. And it can mm -hmm. be really, I think that happens a lot for folks um, as they become parents, right? Mm -hmm. Because again, the narcissist is completely unaware of their own emotional worlds. Mm -hmm. They typically project it onto mm -hmm. their target being the child and then attack, attack, attack. So yeah. we have no idea what are our feelings, what are their feelings. And it can be incredibly dysregulating when our children then have these big feelings. And we have no idea emotionally what's happening for us internally. Absolutely. So that's really important work. I, I have wanna... a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Susie. I was just curious, as a social worker, when you when you were a social worker, what would you do, like, if you went into a family unit and you saw that one of the parents was narcissistic and it was affecting the children? 
Yeah. So I, I haven't done that kind of work. I actually okay. haven't done any work with children, um, okay. but I did do some family therapy sessions, if you will, when I worked inpatient when I worked at the inpatient facility, mm-hmm. you know, to help folks who are struggling with substance use. And yeah, I came across a lot of parents um, yeah. that had narcissistic qualities and mm-hmm. boundaries, boundaries, boundaries. I love yeah. that. I think that's great. I want to bring some attention to Tiffany's comment that we, we had it come up a couple of times and she said that it blows her mind <laughs> that narcissists do this on purpose. And I just want to share a different perspective myself. And, and Elisa, you can share your own opinion about this as well. Sure. And sure. we may differ in opinions, but this is just my own personal experience. Yeah. My dad is the narcissist in my family, but he's so unconscious that he doesn't know that what he's doing is hurtful or, or right. demeaning. And I think that that on purpose, the intention behind the narcissism is to gain a goal, right? It's to get what they want. It's not necessarily to hurt them or to like do what they're doing, but it's just the only way they know how to get what they want. And then again, with my mother being the codependent and the triangulation manipulator, I don't think that her intention was ever to hurt or harm us because she did love us from her perspective of what love is. But there was always the goal to get us to be glued to her hip, best friends with her. And so I feel like that on purpose, the intention behind what they're doing is not intentionally to damage us, but that is what happens. I think that the intention is just to get what they want. And that that's something I really have learned over the last two years. Yeah. Yeah. And I I do agree with that. Other folks who specialize in this may have different schools of thought. Right. I, again, use it as a spectrum, right? So I think Mm -hmm. if you are that textbook, textbook narcissist, even bordering into that antisocial psychopathic kind of place, Mm -hmm. yeah. Do I think sometimes it's done on purpose? Absolutely. Do I think sometimes there's calculated things that are happening? Yes. Do I think that for everybody that has these narcissistic qualities and tendencies? No. I think, again, it's sometimes just Mm -hmm. the air and the supply and the way that they breathe. Yeah, and, and that's what they need, right? Is right. this exchange, this engagement, if you mm-hmm. will? And um, I think sometimes that's not purposeful. Again, it's not what we need. It's not right. the way we needed to be loved or treated. Right. But I don't know that there is that same calculation as somebody that's really on that textbook end. Of Right. And I think for those people too, like it really comes down to circumstances too. Are you fighting about something that they want to win and they'll do anything to win that argument or to win that fight? Sure. That's purposeful. I can Mm -hmm. feel that purposeful to hurt somebody because they feel attacked or they feel demeaning, demeaning, like stuff coming from the people in the family system. But in general, I just feel like they have goals and they have desires and they will do whatever it takes to get those goals and desires. Yeah. Yes. Remembering that the core fear is this fear of abandonment right. or perceived. Absolutely. Or feeling like rejected, right? They don't yes. like feeling rejection. That's right. And they mm-hmm. can't, right? They can't manage mm-hmm. that. So they will scratch That's and claw right. and do whatever they have to do Mm-hmm. Do not have that feeling. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Love that. Um, I know these lovely ladies over here have listened to some of your That's podcasts, funny. and I'm sure that they have some questions about what they were listening to. I do know, though, that one of the topics we're not going to go too deep into because we don't do that here on NATV. Um, so let's try to keep it light and a little bit brief. But, um, you know, ladies, take it away with whatever you have for her about the podcast. You're not the crazy one. Well, the one I went into, and I think Susie and I were both talking about it, was the one on religious trauma and cults, and that was the first one I dove right into, and I'm like, I can't wait to listen <laughs> to more of the yes. show, even today, after I hang out with my son, but I was like, I was just, my body was screaming, because I'm like, oh, I've lived, you know, so many years of this, and I didn't know how much experience you had with it, and I was listening to your right. guests talking about it, and yeah. just how, yeah, like how um you've gotten into those topics, and how you find that has correlated to narcissism as well with the religious trauma and sure yeah um i was fortunate enough to so let me back up i have always been fascinated by cults and Mm. high control groups Mm -hmm. and you name the show about these things i have watched it inhaled it read about it whatever fascinated why how do people you know normal and i'm using that in quotes 
come into these high control groups, right? Like how does somebody just allow themselves to be pulled in? So I've always been fascinated. And um, one day in my inbox, I got an email talking about this training. And I was kind of looking for more training around religious trauma, cult abuse, high control abuse, um, and came across this marvelous um, clinician, Dr. Quincy Gideon, who offers this year-long training. And also simultaneously, you can be in her consultation group, which I thought, ooh, that sounds really good that, you know. Um, and so I just started, you know, training with her, watching the material and reading the material she offers. And then she was kind enough to come on the podcast and really talk more in depth about, um, you know, high control groups such as this. I can't wait to listen to that. Yeah. I, I feel like the, the narcissistic family structure yeah. is a cult. Absolutely. <laughs> and I wasn't in the group. Like, yeah, yeah. They didn't like me. So right. I was the outcast. Me right. too. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. and there was a big group of them. I, I love how um, Dr. Nicola Perra really highlights this in enmeshment, family enmeshment. Yes. Um, for, for us in the beginning as a young child, it was um, domestic violence abuse. And so like that was the thing we were hiding. It was the family secret. And so cults are very much about that, um, of like keeping everything inside. And I love that that is like a very great true. word to describe family enmeshment for sure. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. It's powerful. Really is. And um, I find it interesting that it's all about the um, the attention factor for the narcissist. Like, I, I really relate to this topic as well, and I won't dive into it, but it's really interesting how I got to know how my narcissist doesn't actually, like... He, he turned it into something so different, you know, to control something to have the power and the say and the, you know, the chauvinistic aspect of it, you know, and, and to like really be the, the man of the house kind of thing is really interesting to me, but I'm excited to listen to this episode Quin with Quincy Gideon. Is yeah. that what you said it was? Yeah, Dr. Quincy Gideon based out of LA. Um, yeah really, really interesting. And the, the added bonus is when I go to the consultation groups, I typically get more recommendations of shows to watch. So cool. like, that's, that's a bonus that I love. It's exciting. So if you haven't subscribed or uh, aren't listening on podcasts, whatever podcast platform you're on, please go look up. Uh, you're not the crazy one and check out the episode with Dr. Quincy Gideon. Um, I can't wait to do that. Yeah. Be thanks. Great. Here we are. Episode eight, recovering from Yay. cult abuse and religious trauma. I have to finish it. It was great. Yeah, my, um, the, the person I was with, the abuser would use religion against me. Mm -hmm. Um, he would constantly tell me I'm a liar. I need to repent like all the little terminologies and then get mm -hmm. on his knees after he abused me <laughs> terribly, right. All day and, and pray. Mm -hmm. And was, I used to call him the super Christian and it, it turned me against God, like I'm, I don't consider myself a religious person, but I do have beliefs, and it it made me so stoic to even pray any longer. Mm -hmm. And then once I got out of the, once I started the women's group and started my healing, I would literally sneak across Connecticut state line to New York State and found a little church, mm -hmm. and I would go in, and I felt like okay, I feel safe. Yeah, it was my first feeling of feeling safe because right. the women's group was all on Zoom. You know, and there was like, and I never told a soul in that little church what I was going through. And I do think like I might go back one day and just thank them for wow. making me feel so welcome. Well, and that goes back to you, um, Susie, you mm -hmm. always talk about how you've had to go backwards and like mm -hmm. recreate memories in places that have bad memories. Yes. And I think that's really important to know that that a narcissist has whatever it is that they have. It, it may not be religion. It may be, you know, something completely different. And when we're talking about, you know, um, eating disorders, I know there are narcissists that, you know, live and breathe fitness. And so there are things that they use. The whole purpose behind it is to make you feel demeaned and and less than 
who they are, right? It's all about making you feel lower. And so I find it interesting. It doesn't matter what it is. It can be religion. It can be fitness. It can be food. It can just be anything that is a lifestyle that they live and breathe to make that the reason why you're not good enough. And it's just simply not true, right? Oh like, And that's their actual belief of themselves. Absolutely. Right? right? That's something to keep in mind is their mm -hmm. belief is they, they despise themselves and mm -hmm. then they put it all and project vomit Rub it all on you. Pack it, right? Mm -hmm. So when we have all these feelings of not good enough, that's their feelings that have right. got placed on us. Absolutely. And it's, it's totally really okay scary. if those things are your triggers, and right? Like where if you actually say that to them. When I think back now, I it's it's a little frightening. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Because yeah. they were they they're they're really telling you everything they're doing and exactly who they are and we're just not accepting mm -hmm. it. I, how could you accept it? It can't be true. I wouldn't treat someone like that or behave this way. Or well, I think the best Ooh. of people, right? You want to believe the best, yeah, for a while right. until they keep showing you. Well, and that goes back to childhood. Eventually yeah. To yes. We and as children not... want to, we want our parents to be our safe place and our, our heroes. Yeah. And I like what Tiffany just said about how, you know, work and career, you know, that's money, financial abuse. I had that as well. I, I completely resonate with that, Tiffany, um, that I've had a struggle taking care of myself financially because it wasn't to the standards of what my family thought I was supposed to be doing. Yeah. Okay. Feel that. Mm -hmm. Oh, Yeah. Of Ladies, course. do you have any All more questions for Elisa? <laughs> I have one question. Could you tell you me know, about the wolves? I would, but I don't want to torture her anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was, I, well, I was stalking your social media. Yeah. I saw in your story the wolves. Yeah. And I, I love wolves. Mm -hmm. And I was just curious, is that a rescue? Yeah, yeah. We just did this yesterday, actually. Um, so a couple of my clients had told me about this uh like wolf sanctuary for rescued wolves mm -hmm. and where you can go and, and meet them and, mm -hmm. you know, wow. interact with them. And so we did that yesterday and it was, it, I mean, I don't know what I expected, but it far exceeded it. We had a wonderful guide that kind of took us from pen to pen, told us about the wolves in each pen, mm -hmm. told us, you know, about their behaviors. Um, you could see just the beauty of them and how wonderfully they've been treated there. And it was amazing. And I had never seen a wolf like actually howl like that. Mm. You know, that was unbelievable. Yeah. I was wondering how did they, is there like a cue? Do they train them? How did they get them to howl? <laughs> we all howled and then the wolves howled. That's awesome. Oh my gosh. If you haven't seen it, you have to go check out Alyssa's um ig on our stories yes. because it, i was like so intrigued i'm like i need to find out where that place is yeah i love it's, that it's in jackson really cool uh new jersey so like right by okay. six flags okay i kind of know that area yeah, yeah. that is interesting Damn. Damn. animals are so healing too right oh, yes, animals absolutely yeah did I you find this in her story where was this yes it was on her ig story yeah okay Love it. Oh, I had a similar experience. Do you have any pets, Elisa? <laughs> yeah, I do. I have a dog who now we're going to, we try, I'm, I think he's part wolf, mm -hmm. but, um, <laughs> that, but um, and I have a cat. And the funny Ooh. thing the guy said yesterday was that wolves are actually, these are like dog wolves. So they're, you know, 96% wolf, let's say part dog. Um, mm -hmm. but what the guide said was mm -hmm. that they're actually more like cats than they are dogs. They do oh. what they want. They ignore you if they want to ignore oh. you. They, you know, so it's, they don't have that pleasing nature that dogs that have. Sense. Yeah. I love that. Right. I'm, I'm definitely a cat person sense. myself. I was going to say, I had a similar experience at a sanctuary out here in Colorado. It's in Keensburg. Okay. Um, and it's a big cat rescue um, where they have lions and panthers and leopards. Um, and they have this huge, like a walkway that's a mile high. Of, or I think it's like maybe not a mile, but it's like a maybe a half mile high so that you're not in their environment. Um, and I went for my birthday years ago. And when we came back to the like Cubs den, they were all roaring at the same time. And oh, one wow. of the volunteers said, this never happens. This is such a cool experience. Mm -hmm. And 
<laughs> I love lions. It's like my jam. So I think that's so cool that you got to experience it. Yeah, like, it oh was, man, that'd be so great. cool. It was a really um, amazing experience. It's so cool. Wild animals are amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I can't wait to go. Stuff. You guys have convinced me. Look it up. What about New Year's? Do you guys have any plans, Elisa, for New Year's? Get your year started off right. A colleague, a former colleague of my husband's, um, who is a teacher, just hang out there. Nothing big. I feel like that's the way to do it these days. Yeah. Perfect. I try to do things with the kids and like have New Mm -hmm. Year's happen at like nine o'clock. Yeah. And we just like put a countdown on the TV and it's like, happy new year. And then put them to bed. And then we have our own new year's after, you know, I, I don't even need, like, I'm happy to not stay up till midnight. There you go. I have that actually. So I love that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm old. You know, you it's know? so true. I have my meditation music. Oh. You're only as old as you want to be, Elisa. That's how I feel. I tell people <laughs> that all the time. Yeah. Sometimes I'm hey, old. Heidi. Sleep is important, though. I think like the 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 older you get, the younger you feel because you start taking care of your body the right way, right? Like, very you start true. Recognizing what's actually important and being out until midnight is not important as much as you know just celebrating and having a good time with people that you care about at home. So true. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's amazing. Like now that I'm, I'll be fifty six in March, and I still feel like I'm sixteen mm-hmm. in my mind. It's yeah. it's the strangest thing. We like, all think you are. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I have a whole post about that, Susie. I'm like a there's big this, kid. There's this epic post about um, somebody asking an older woman in her 80s, mm-hmm. like, how does it feel being at the end of your life cycle? And she was like, you know, mm-hmm. honestly, I am still a little girl. And every time I've looked in the mirror growing up, my body has aged, but I'm still the same little girl in my body. And I find that very true. Like the whole, you know, true. soul having a body experience mm-hmm. versus a body having a spiritual experience. Yeah. It kind of flips as you get older, mm-hmm. you know, like now I feel like I'm getting younger. And when you're and younger, you want to be older. Right. Like mm-hmm. pay attention to this, pay attention to that, pay attention to this. Like we're trained what to pay attention to until we yeah. start learning what is actually important to pay attention to. It's good stuff. Yeah. That's the one of the best so parts true. about being on the outside of the abuse now, right? Once you get through it is it's, it's exciting. Life is mm-hmm. exciting again. So it's almost like getting a new lease on life, you know? Yeah. There's a song called that new lease on is life. There? It's a country song and it's so good. I love good. country. Yeah. I got to check that, that out. <laughs> I'm literally writing it down. I love it. it, it I think it's called new lease on life. It's really okay. good. Great song. Good. Check it out. A little romantic. You know, that's my jam. (laughs) All right. I'm curious. What is your favorite genre of um, television or movies being somebody from the industry? Wow. Um, I love a good psychological, not, I guess, thriller, but also, I guess it's a thriller, but I don't, I I don't want to scare myself purposely. So that's. (laughs) But I love to like figure things out and figure out the puzzle Mystery. pieces. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and make connections. Like I was really knee deep in the Anna Delvey, um, you know, uh, inventing Anna. I thought I was fascinated with that, and um, I don't know. I like I like good character stories where you really you are invested in the story. You're invested in the characters in the story. Mm-hmm. You know, Barbie loved Barbie, of course get enough of that I love me that. too yeah that was great i honestly haven't seen it yet because i am not sure if i want to take my six-year-old to see it i haven't decided like for me i have to gauge like can i watch this by myself do i need to wait for it to come mm, out on social media yeah. street or um, yeah. streaming services like because then i'll pop them in my ears and listen to it on my phone or something you know like barbie was more geared to a little older i think that's audience what i felt mm-hmm. that's what i, I literally from it when I, when I was yeah. done watching yeah. it the following week, I had therapy and I, I said to Dr. Mack, I'm like, I want to go back in the box. Just put me back in the box because it was like a rough, you know, it was a couple months ago that I saw it. I was not having a good week and I really felt like Barbie. I'm out in the real world. It's not easy all the time, you know, and it can be all fun. And I was just like, put me back. 
so I think was... that that's what comes in waves in life. Um, yeah. I think that's like the grief, you know, of realizing that life isn't quite the way you want it to be. Um, I've been yeah. going through that myself. I had a meltdown last week that I just lost my mind. I was in tears the whole day. Addie yeah. was like, do you need to stay home? Can you call somebody yeah. to come get me? And I was like, this kid, she and knows. Mom I has think, been like a long time. Yeah. I think it's important. Um, Alisa, would you agree that, that we, we allow ourselves, like be easy on ourselves, you know, cause I was so hard on myself and we really need to have patience with ourselves and, we understand we're going to make mistakes, you know, mm -hmm. and it's well, not absolutely. always fun. No, yeah. no. And that, that is light. You know, I don't like to sugarcoat it for people. Right. Recovery from this type of abuse is incredibly hard. There's a lot of times we're going to feel a lot worse until we feel yeah. better. Um, it's not a magic cure to just mm -hmm. happy, happy, happy rainbows and sunshine all the time. Um, you know, but but again, we are waiting for ourselves on the other side of this. And in order to have joy in our lives, we have to be able to feel, mm -hmm. the, you know, the darker emotions as well. And that is part of life. Mm -hmm. So the other side is not happiness. It's radical acceptance, right? I would say it's authentic self. <laughs> yeah. Radical acceptance. Yeah. For yeah, me, it was go. it was allowing myself to feel. Yeah, because yeah. I have no feeling, good, bad, or indifferent. I was just like oh, a separate wife, took mm -hmm. care of everyone mm -hmm. else, isn't that? And I literally had to learn how to feel, how to cry, yes. how to laugh. Yeah, it sounds crazy, Survival but to the next. Yeah, yeah, you're not um, the crazy one, Susie. That's you're it. Not. I'm not the crazy one. You are not. <laughs> yeah, it's, thank it's you. How to be in relationship with ourselves, yeah. with, with ourselves, the world, with others. Mm -hmm. right enhancing that contact mm -hmm. absolutely yeah. because when you feel joy coming out of a narcissistic system or just abuse in general and trauma you're waiting for the other shoe to drop i can't tell you how many times i've heard from friends um from followers from subscribers all these people they're always waiting for the other shoe to drop when they're enjoying life they're not enjoying it yeah and then it gets real quiet for me. <laughs> like I'm in the quiet stage right now and I'm just enjoying the peace. Yeah, it's good. You know, no expectations, mm -hmm. just enjoying the peace. And I'm sleeping, sleeping and eating, two things that I took for granted. Right. So I'm so yeah. happy for you, Susie. I know, right? I'm finally ahead. like sleeping and eating. <laughs> it's like so yes. exciting. You're winning. Mm -hmm. I'm doing it. Yes, you are. Yeah. Love it. Well, Lisa, we're so grateful that you came on the show. Yes. Um, and anyone who is following, listening, we're, we're so grateful you're here listening today. Yeah. Um, don't forget, uh, check out Elisa's website. She's got her link tree in her bio on Instagram. Elisa, tell us what your Instagram page is again. Yeah, I think it's um, at Elisa Stamp Stuff Therapist. Love it. So you can check it out there. And she's got the Gaslighting Recovery Journal available on Amazon, which is the second book. You said there was a first one. What's the first one? The first one is the Gaslighting Recovery Journal, and okay. then written by a colleague of mine. And then I wrote the second up in that series, the Gaslighting. I'm sorry, the, hers is the oh. Gaslighting Recovery book. Mine is the Gaslighting Recovery Journal. Okay, so you have the journal that goes along with a book that was written. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, cool. Yeah. And then we've got You're Not imagine. the Crazy One podcast yeah. available on all podcast um, platforms. Right. We've got Apple. We've got um, Spotify. What were the other ones? There are other ones, aren't uh, there? iHeartRadio and some Heart great Radio. episodes. One just dropped working uh, where I, I um, my guest was a dietitian who mm -hmm. helps folks with eating disorders. So it's kind of coming at it from a different viewpoint. Cool. And then I have upcoming episodes. Um, a new one waiting to be dropped is a couple colleagues that I uh, know of, and they're going to talk about the intersection between eating disorders and infertility. So definitely Amazing. be on the lookout for that one. Yeah, awesome. it, it was so interesting. interesting. I did, you know, know a lot about that topic area, and they were so courageous in sharing, you know, a lot of their information and their own experiences as well. So I love that. That's amazing. Um, do you do sessions? I do. I see folks individually. So you can check that out as well. Perfect. Mm -hmm. We appreciate you guys coming on today. Thank, Thank you so much.